Welcome. You are listening to the Marriage Underdogs radio show, and I'm your host, Chris A. Matthews. You are in for another treat. Today, my guest is Naquan Lewis, founder of Intimate Connections PLLC. Naquan is a licensed marriage and family therapist, licensed professional counselor, and certified sex therapist. Plus, she's also a speaker and consultant. Wow, you, you wear a lot of hats, so I'm just so glad that we're able to suck up all your ex- expertise. Thank you for being here, Naquan. You are absolutely welcome. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Um, so those that have been listening to the show, I, I am a little biased with uh, licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, hence, most of our experts tend to be in that LMFT space or coaching relationships. I always like to ask, especially our licensed marriage and family therapists of color, uh, how did you get into the field? I got into this field for a number of reasons, but my primary reason is being an overcomer of trauma myself and becoming the person that I needed to be for my children. And also, so being an overcomer of trauma means that I have, I know the importance of relationships and having effective models for relationships. And so I became an LMFT and all the other uh, letters because one I know not having quality mental health providers that look like you it's a challenge right there's only four percent four percent of black people uh, or therapists are black right and so sexual health providers in that realm is even less than that so I'm practically a, a unicorn so I became a therapist to interrupt generational dysfunction, to increase representation, and to heal families, especially in uh, the Black community. I'm, I'm so glad to hear you share what led you into the field because the term wounded warrior comes to mind. When you think about clinicians that have endured their own trauma, but they didn't allow their setback to hold them back. They use their setback as a setup for a comeback. And you're now able to share your experience of healing with others to help them gain that same uh, reciprocity and to to get past the uh, traumas they might have endured. And I know that your specialty is in the sex education space. Can you talk about what you feel clients are missing out on the most, which lead them to seek your services? So clients have been taught from society, from a lot of different um, angles, I'll say that, you know, pleasure is is for the other person, right? Mm -hmm. They've been taught that sex is a dirty word and that they don't deserve pleasure. And so people come see me when they need and want intimacy and desire intimacy. They come see me when they have sexual health issues and not just including um, disorders and pain, but including that, but also they may have an unhealthy relationship with sex itself, right? From an independent standpoint within their marriage or their relationship. So they come see me for a number of reasons. A lot of things I deal with are um, desire discrepancy. So people having a difference in libido, um, non-existent or a lack of intimacy, and also having the misunderstanding that intimacy only refers to sex. Intimacy is a lot of other things, right? There are five main types of intimacy, including mental, emotional, physical, um, recreation, experiential, experiential, which just means uh, like shared hobby is an interest and spiritual and there's tons of others right but there are those those five kind of umbrella ones even financial intimacy right That's yes I mean. yeah yes so i assist people so my tagline is i assist individuals and couples with improving intimacy with themselves first and then others mm-hmm. and so i'm helping people to live a pleasure-centered life including sex but definitely not limited to it i love that pleasure-centered life and there's this idea or thought that everybody should just naturally know how to find pleasure. But what you said earlier about your upbringing, if you come from a household or a culture where sex or even pleasure in general is looked upon as something you weren't entitled to, and especially 
as I listen to women and I become a student of women that I counsel and I remain a student of my wife. And I recall hearing some stories from, from women I was listening to, they were describing how when they were growing up, they were told to serve uh, the men in the home. And it almost appeared to be this notion that they weren't worthy or entitled to the same levels of pleasures. So I want to ask you to talk about how there may be a societal discrepancy around women being entitled just as men are to obtain pleasure. And I ask this question because when you look at all of the commercials or the pharmacy uh, commercials for medication, it always talks about erectile dysfunction and it appears the only focus on male pleasure. So talk about where you feel some of those gaps are in our culture when it comes to making sure women have just as equal amount of rights and entitlements to pleasures just as much as men do. Absolutely. So a lot of this is, is rooted in patriarchy, mm -hmm. right? And so women that come see me, I assist them in building their sexual confidence within themselves with understanding that they deserve pleasure. It is their birthright and how to dismantle those patriarchal, you know, beliefs. And so you hit the nail on the head with all these advertisements. There's all these um, tools, which are great for men to prioritize pleasure, but, you know, women have issues as well. Mm -hmm. And so they come and see me and we talk about that. And we, I work with other providers in the medical field to um, assist women with their sexual health. So there's an unfortunate stigma around of course we know about the stigma around mental health right that we have to dismantle there's also a stigma around sexual health mm -hmm. and that women in general have been taught that we are here to serve others and we are here to serve others but we are here to serve ourselves first and foremost and so dismantling these beliefs is definitely become my mission right and i and i just think that from a cultural lens, especially a lot of the music, the music objectifies women and makes them appear to only be valuable as instruments or tools to satisfy the pleasures of men. And I I, I just I don't like that for a couple of reasons. One is disrespectful in the sense of just de dehumanizing women. And as a girl dad, right, having a daughter, I, I definitely don't want anyone especially a future mate of hers to see the lack of value when it comes to her mind and her emotions and all of who she is right but but I also think when you look at pleasure and I'm talking for real men so I define a real man as one that's not selfish that sees the value of serving as woman a lot of the men I counsel in therapy they seek to obtain pleasure when they pleasure their partner and can you talk about how men husbands listening men that might be in relationships or men seeking a relationship how can men do a better job of being mindful of of meeting their their their, their wives or their, their their women's sexual needs and pleasures outside of just our own as men can you talk about that Yes. Yeah, so it's, it starts and ends really with communication. Mm -hmm. There is a, that's a huge issue that I um, see with uh, anybody that I treat. There are just, there's a lot of fear around talking about sexual health, um, so intimacy, and not necessarily knowing how to approach these very sensitive topics. So for men, see your partner as a whole person. There's a lot of things, especially when their wives or girlfriends become mothers also, right? They tend to see them through, through these very specific and limiting lenses. Mm -hmm. See, and it goes back to LMFT training, the whole systemic, seeing a person as a whole, right? And, and the sum of all their parts. See your partners as a whole person. It's okay for them. And it's necessary for them to honor that sexual part of them. But they're all also intelligent. They're also 
you know, maybe mothers or students or entrepreneurs or CEOs, right? So seeing them as a whole person and being curious about their wants, needs, and desires and asking, at verbalizing, because okay. in communication, you know, well, I'm not communicating it, but you, are you communicating in a way where it's being received? Mm. So clarifying, right? Clarifying statements, being very understanding about what they want, need, and desire, and being consistent with that practice. And and I appreciate you mentioning consistency because we as people are always constantly changing and evolving. And there are different seasons. Husbands and wives go through seasons where libido might be increased or decreased. It also may be biological due to age. I also think that as a man, I'm speaking for, for men that I've counseled and even myself, we we tend to obtain a level of frustration when patterns are broken, right? Like as a man, if you're accustomed to a frequency of sex and then child rearing gets in the way or your spouse starts a new job or encounters a level of stress, I think it's just different. Like I remember um, I I lost my great uncle. He, he had passed away at the age of 93 and leaving the wake, I was um, with my wife and, and we were in the bed and we were um, close. And all of a sudden I started to initiate sex. And she was like, what? We just left the wake of your uncle and you're initiating sex. I was like, yeah, this will make me feel better. So as we go through the act and she, you know, later, a couple of days later, she was like, you were able to have sex like right after you know, your uncle's weight, like, weren't you sad? I was like, yeah, but connecting with you made me feel better. And then when her uncle passed away, it was like a week and a half. You know like she was in this mind state of like grieving. I grieved by wanting to be even closer to my wife sexually. Uh, can you talk about maybe the differences of how men and women, are, and I'm not saying all women are like my wife or all men are like me, but just in general, I just wanted to open that up to understanding from your line of work, work working in the sex health space, if you see uh, some comparable differences between men and women that are, are more than no, the norm. I'm not saying that all men and all women are the same. You have your outliers, but just talk about the, the gen how gender may play a different role as it relates to sex. So for me, it what I have found is that women struggle with intimacy when there is a lack of follow through and a lack of consistency that men may not be connecting with, right? Because men tend to, they're looking through this lens where, you know, if I am a provider or if I am, you know, doing what I feel needs to be done, then I'm pretty good. But for women, under, well, in general, understand that a lack of consistency and a lack of follow through interrupts trust and emotional safety. And so for a lot of women that I work with, when they don't have that emotional safety, they're not wanting to be intimate. Not everybody, right? But a lot of people, they don't want to be intimate because they don't feel that security with you. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand that they don't connect that, okay, well, you know, this is this is light. This is a little thing. But that little thing to you after a period of time and after it repeated re repeated behavior and a lack of consistency. You're interrupting the security and safety for women. And so go ahead. You were going to no, say I would say that that makes a lot of sense, because I recall being in a therapy session with a couple and it was really important for the wife to come down in the morning and see no dishes in the sink. That gave her a sense of security to know that the husband followed through, right? Using your words, followed through with the responsibility of doing the dishes every night, especially after she had done them and he came home later and couldn't even put his plate in the dishwasher. And throughout the process of altering the system, right? The more task he was able to follow through with, the symptom look like increasing frequency of sex. And you know, in the work we do, we, we tend to, to lean towards second order change. All our clients may not seek second order change. And for those that are listening, 
we use the example first order change is you buy a house and you you change some carpet out you might paint the walls put up a ceiling fan second order change is you buy a house you demolish the house on the same land and rebuild a brand new house right and and, and in a lot of the work that, that we do as MFTs, we look at altering the system so the symptoms will follow. Uh, can you talk about how a couple can do a better job of diagnosing what's needed to improve frequencies or even quality of sex when it comes, frequency or even quality of sex when it comes to enhanced gratification? Yes. Um, really quickly, I, I want to highlight your analogy um, with the dishes and the couple that you met with, because a lot of people don't don't understand that it's just dishes. It's just dishes. It is not the dishes. It's what the dishes represent. Right. So for your person that your the wife that was, you know, upset about the dishes not being done, the husband may be thinking, well, damn, it's just dishes. But what it represents is me feeling heard. Mm. It represents you following through being consistent right it represents me feeling that i can count on you so understand it's always the underlying issues it's not just the dishes i just want to point that out because it is a very common thing that i deal with with my couples right. and if there's a disconnect with that because one is looking at the detail they're both looking at the details but we got to get to those underlying issues absolutely so for anybody dealing with the details, what's under that? What are you feeling? Now, this second order change. I'm sorry, repeat the question. No, no worries. I I, I was ready for it because I we, I knew I knew that was gonna happen because you did such a great job of explaining that the dishes weren't just the dishes, but the emotion. The question was to highlight different approaches that couples can take to alter their system. So the symptoms can change, right? So the system looking at the larger perspective, not just, it's just dishes, but finding more meaning within the relationship to get what both partners are seeking or wanting. Yes. So there are several tools um, that assist couples with doing this. And basically you want to create various shared meanings of different things that are especially causing you conflicts and issues. For example, trust. Have you taken the time to define what trust means to each partner? Oftentimes we are not having the same conversations. So, so to build that house up, break it down and build it up means that we are defining different things. Trust, what a healthy relationship looks like, what a healthy sex life looks like, you know, what is an exciting sex life looks like. We are having shared conversations, shared meanings and understanding. Okay. And breaking it down to like, okay, we're talking about a healthy sex life. What does that look like? What, what is ideal? Not holding anybody's feet to the fire, but what would be ideal? I'm talking about two times a week. We're talking about the type of, you know, fantasies and things that a person may want to indulge in. And so basically to build a house means you are building this house on healthy principles and foundations and you can utilize tools. I don't know, would it be a good time to to talk about um, the products right now? Yeah, so I, I know you, you, you offer products and... I, I want to hear about the products. Perfect timing. But before you do that, you said something that I want to highlight. Yes. When you talk about shared meaning and you, you have the logistical parts of sex, right? The frequency, the types. I, I, I believe that we tend to forget about the turn-ons. And yes. I noticed as I'm going deeper into marriage, we just celebrated 14 years married, 18 together. Congratulations. With, with, with a, oh, thank you. So with me, like the turn ons really have been the same 18 years, right? Like my wife can put on a particular outfit, uh, lingerie, like, you know, if she was to initiate in any capacity, it could be a text message, right? I, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm there, right? Like mine have been consistent, right? <laughs> I don't really change. Hers have evolved, right? Like we're now in this stage where we have three kids, uh, two in elementary, one in high school. So the turn on might look like, you know what, when I get home, I'm going to check all the homework. Ooh, I'm going to make sure all the kids are ready for bath and bedtime. Wow. 
I'm going to have dinner and do the dishes. Ooh, <laughs> right? So it's like the turn-ons represent a couple of things. One, wow, like you're you're being a good partner. I can trust you. You're being a good parent. Two, you're taking the load off of my plate so I can catch up on some leisure activities I may not have time for. Three, you're you're seeing us as a collective unit and those things lead to trust which then open up the door for more initiation of sex or more frequencies more frequency of having sex or even the willing to be riskier in the bedroom the yeah. more your partner can trust you the more they might be willing to put on a blindfold or do something that they haven't done before or try something new and um it sounded like that's what you were talking about when you, when you were going into the shared meaning and understanding how to to get more out of your partner by giving them more absolutely and by making sure that your foundation is solid a healthy foundation consists of compassion trust and respect there oh, is a lot compassion trust and respect yes those okay. are the the, 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 the passion trust and respect yes if your foundation is missing any of those, it has a huge crack in it, a huge crack. And of course, there are necess other necessary components, but you definitely have to have those. And, emotion and in order for you to build emotional, emo I'm sorry, emotional safety, you have to have those three. And so emotional safety says, I feel safe with you putting a blindfold on me, or I feel safe with you following through. And in order for me to feel safe, that means that, there's consistency. That means that the, the communication is effective. I feel heard. I feel seen. I feel respected, right? So that builds the emotional safety. Then I feel more connected with you and would like to likely engage in the various types of intimacy. Mm -hmm. So how do we get that back? Because our show is Marriage Underdogs. A lot of our listeners may be in a challenging season of marriage where they've lost some of that safety. They've lost the willingness to to sustain respect meaning they might be a little bit you know quicker to say something that might be piercing right um yeah. they may not have the desire to want to always follow through instead of coming home immediately after work they might want to go hang out with friends because they're in a really tough place how, how do those couples start to turn toward each other turn back toward each other i might say I take my couples back to the beginning. I take them, I, I tell them, we're going back to the basics. When a couple is in a space where, you know, respect is not on the table, the, the, the foundation has that crack in it, right? How do we repair it? Sometimes we have to dismantle it and rebuild it because maybe this marriage does not reflect who you are in the present and it reflects who you, you know, may have married. So I am big on couples reviving and revising their relationships to make sure that the relationship reflects who they are and not where they've been. Now, when, not you, only take, where you, they've been. Now, when you take that couple back, I've seen this in counseling. I'm sure you have as well. I know a week isn't a long period of time, but how do you diff, like how do you coach or counsel couples through? divvying out rewards because there may be a, a husband he's just, he's seeking more uh sex or, or intimacy or closeness not even just sex like just wanting to, to their partner to be around them more right and you know he has a week of therapy and he's like okay i'm gonna try these tools i'm gonna be more considerate i'm gonna come home straight after work i'm gonna do the dishes and i know a week is only a week but i'll hear one of the other i'll hear the female partner typically say well he only did it for about six days and I didn't really want to give him any sex because I didn't want him to think that, you know, he arrived just because he did it for six days. So how do you talk about like using sex as a reward? Is that, is that emotionally safe? Um, you know, what, what's your perspective on that? <laughs> using sex as a reward for, for people in a relationship. So with my couples, first of all, you want to be realistic about the journey, right? Yeah. Because therapy is a journey just, Going back to the basics, building your foundation is a journey. It is not, you didn't get this way overnight and it's not going to be an overnight fix. And that's literally what I say to them. And so I um, definitely encourage couples to not use sex as uh, rewards because it's supposed to be something that's safe and connecting, right? And so 
also, are you affirming the behavior that you want to see? I'm a firm believer in positive reinforcement for in marriage, with our children, you know, in friendships, whatever, at work, in the professional space, positive reinforcement. So instead of using sex as that positive reinforcement, did you, you know, th thank you. This is the behavior. This is what I'm looking for, right? Affirming that this is what helps me to feel seen, safe, respected, whatever the case may be. And so using sex or utilizing sex to keep us connected and close and not as a manipulation tactic. Got you. So I get what you're saying, like manipulation being I'm going to take sex away because you didn't do something right. Um, but you're saying if a partner was to use sex as positive reinforcement, that would that would be manipulative too. <laughs> Well, so there's a here's the thing, right? It's like dangling the carrot. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to utilize sex, let it be because you want to connect. Now, I'm definitely not saying no, it's absolutely okay and necessary for some people whenever they want to. They have anybody has the right to say no, and consent is imperative, even right. in me, right? However, you know, if you want to connect with your partner, then let it be because you want to connect with your partner. If you want to use it as a reward, that's one thing, but taking it away to punish specifically. I like that. Yeah, not using it as a punishment. And I share because um for men, we we look at like sex is trust. Because if a man is 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 doing everything he needs to do and he's still not getting sex, it's like, well, man, you know. What's wrong with me? <laughs> like, you know, um, I think it's a trust thing too. Like, and, and, and I've learned this over years of being married. This isn't anything I read in the textbook. I just know that like in my in my own marriage, if my wife says to me, hey, you know, ooh, it's going to be a special night and I'm anticipating having sex. And I've heard a lot of men say this as well. Like when you go to date night for us, it's like, you know, the cherry on the top of the set, right? Like we're enjoying the movie. We enjoy the conversation at dinner. We're enjoying, you know, the, the, the car ride. We're enjoying the laughter. But for us, it's that 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 closing on the night. And in the event that your partner is unable to give you that, I always suggest that in order to really build trust with a husband or a man, be be good on the next time, right? Like make sure that the rain check follows through. <laughs> um, you know, like I remember my wife, she, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm dead tired at night. I just, I just can't, I can't do it. No worry. Tomorrow I'm expecting the whole nine though. Like the rain check is almost like, instead of it just being like the traditional, then the rain check is going, okay, no problem. I'll be patient for 24 hours because now I get to get something I wasn't going to get before. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, so, I mean, and, and you see how we're laughing about it. I think I want, I want to hear your opinion on like, the fun part of pleasure. Sometimes it can be so technical that it takes the fun away. And, you know, I just want to get, get that insight because like, I'll tell couples like, Hey, it's okay to plan sex. And then some couples are like, I'll plan sex. It, it seems like it would make it boring or take the fun away. Uh, you know, so what's your take on those two questions? One, um, keeping it fun and two, planning sex. So keeping it fun for me, I believe is is important. It enhances pleasure, but that comes when you are, you know, having sex with somebody that you really are connected with, mm -hmm. right? Again, I believe that good sex is a result of a healthy relationship. And so playing with sex is a sign that, you know, you're being intimate with somebody that you're not just um, married to, but that you enjoy, right? Right? that you enjoy and that that is a, a game changer and so also it takes the it reduces the chances of performance anxiety when you play with sex and you focus on pleasure and not just the orgasm that mm -hmm. is a big thing that i deal with is performance anxiety with men and women because they are so focused on the goal of orgasming when the goal should be pleasure and pleasure is explored through erogenous zones, not just penetration, right? And so, so many people are focused on, did you come yet? Did you come yet? Did you come yet? Let's focus on the pleasure, the the joy of it all. And the process and the journey, not the destination. Yes. 
Yeah. Now, what do you? What's your take on, especially for those that may have busy, complex lives, on planning sex? And if so, if, if planning sex is okay, how do we plan sex as a couple? Like, how do the couples listen to plan sex? I'm a huge advocate, huge advocate for planning sex because please understand that planning sex means that you, it, planning sex and follow through. Mm -hmm. means that you're having it versus the couples that that i'm advocating for planning they're not having sex and sex mm -hmm. so a sexless relationship um used to be at least one time a month but it's been it's it's reduced some um where it's more twice i, I believe the statistics show it's like twice a month you're technically in what's considered a sexless relationship now it's only a problem when it's a problem Let's be clear on that, right? Sex is an important part of a relationship for those that it's important to. You have healthy relationships that, you know, don't have sex for whatever reason, and that's their choice. But for those that want it, be it if it's, you know what, we're parents, life is life in, we're busy, right? We have all the things going on. What happens? Sex goes by the wayside. Mm -hmm. What happens? connection sometimes goes with it and that's the number one way to move into their roommate space mm -hmm. right and we don't want that so i advocate to plan sex and know that just because it's planned for wednesday night at 10 doesn't mean it's going to be or it has to be robotic that's up to you and your partner it mm -hmm. could still be just as spontaneous and fun as you want it to and as you create it to be absolutely so, and i think that's the part that really stands out just because you may have the time frame, there's so many other avenues and doors of, of spontaneity can be created. You're just setting the playing field. When you think about like it's, it's entering football season, there might be a football game, the schedule, it doesn't make it less exciting to watch because you still don't know the plays that are being called. You don't know who's going to win. You don't know the touchdowns. So that's just like saying planning a sporting event or a concert is going to take the joy out of attending it, right? Yes. <laughs> so, so um, and, and that's something to highlight as well with these these preconceived notions. Like I'll, I'll hear couples in therapy, I'll bring up the idea of planning sex, and they automatically will tell me, "Oh, that's not going to work. That's not going to work." And luckily, you know, in therapy, they'll they'll try, it and they're always like, "Oh my gosh, why 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 are we just doing this?" Yeah. Um, so being open, being open. Another area I want to talk about with sex, um, when you think about infidelity, right, I'll, I'll find that there are a lot of reasons why couples may step out. Um, but what really is fascinating is there may be a couple who have a frequency of sex and they have phenomenal sex lives and one partner still cheats. Talk about from your experience and, you know, with couples, wh where that may come from or what you what you uncover when working with those couples, the reasons why that still may happen. Absolutely. So people tend to think that, oh, I must be unhappy with my partner and or my sex life if I step out of my relationship. And that's definitely not always the case. And oftentimes it's not the case. There are several reasons why people engage in infidelity. One, a lack of shared definition. Hmm. I'm big on that, right? Yeah. Defining fidelity. If you want to be monogamous, if you are entering a monogamous relationship, have you defined what that looks like? Have you defined what fidelity for you and your partner looks like? Because it's not going to look the same as somebody else, right? So I'm talking about boundaries identifying the, here are the boundaries within our relationship. Here's what helps us to feel respected. So infidelity could happen because somebody's having an emotional relationship with somebody and we have not discussed that that is a violation. So being unclear on the boundaries of the relationship. Ego is, is a big one. A so there are a lot of people and this comes from our stuff. So when I say our stuff, I'm talking about the stuff that we all bring into our relationships, mm -hmm. right? The stuff that we grew up with. Everybody has had some kind of childhood that could be, that has some kind of traumatic experiences oftentimes. Trauma being defined as a variety of things, just unwanted experiences. You could also have, you have people that, grew up with seeing this, witnessing it, right? Witnessing infidelity, whether it be their caregivers, their parents, so 
TV, media, right? And so it is viable. Some people, right? Like some people, and you've heard couples say, um, hey, people just cheat. It's almost like just throwing the towel in, like it's 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 just what happens. It's just what happens. Yeah. It's just, it's what happens when that's been your experience. Right. And none of those factors are solely correlated to sex. So if someone's listening and you're battling infidelity or you're going through that process now of of, of, of remending, you know, mending a relationship after infidelity, it doesn't mean your partner cheated on you just because uh, the, the sex life wasn't wasn't good, right? And I think that's that's something I'm glad that you shared. Now, for those healthy couples, couples yeah. who are having uh, sex at the frequency they desire, they're in love with their partner. They feel safe. They feel a level of trust. There's compassion. There's respect. Talk about the products that you provide and how they can assist with couples that have healthy sex lives. Absolutely. So the products that I provide and I will I'll uh, show you. So these are my uh, how do you want it? relationship and sex conversation cards there are 50 cards i'm sorry 55 cards in here that are broken down into three sections healthy relationships boundaries and sex and intimacy or actually sexual intimacy and so this is the digital guide to intimacy is digital right so i just printed out for myself and so this is it has the questions it has psychoeducation to help you implement the strategies. It has places to process. It has bonus questions and um, so many other things. And so I've created these products for both the people that are ha- having great sex lives and want to enhance it and the couples that need to take it back to the basics. So when I say I take them back to the basics, I utilize these products because these products are built in on um, principles that assist with creating that foundation with that trust, compassion, and respect. It assists with, with defining the various shared definitions that we need to build healthy relationships. And so for the couple that is that has a healthy sex life, um, but may want to enhance it, they still may not know what questions to ask. So I've done the legwork for you. And so let's see. Here's so there's one there's one of the cards and this is sexual intimacy. Describe how you like foreplay. Mm. How you like foreplay. And it takes the assumption out, right? I think a lot of men and women for that matter, if you don't have healthy examples, and unfortunately a lot of men um have turned to asking other people or even some may turn to to pornography and i think we have to debunk this this myth that you're supposed to automatically know how to please your partner oh my goodness and that question right there was very important because something as simple as foreplay may not even be talked on talked about right so and our definitions of foreplay definitions too right like what you deem foreplay and like you said for a woman yeah. who has a hard day that foreplay is have me some dinner ready when mm-hmm. i get off of work on a late night right mm-hmm. make sure the things are taken care of that can 100 percent be a form of foreplay that turns a woman on and gets her going Absolutely. right so mm-hmm. defining foreplay and talking about it because so many people are they may be having sex but they're not talking about it Right. And it is that effective communication that takes your sex life and your relationship to the next level. And your cards do that. Your cards create a space where communication can be had in a safe manner. And it takes the guessing out of it. Most yeah, people yeah. aren't sex educators. They can't come up with the right questions. And it sounds like the cards that you have provide the definitions, the questions. It helps the user walk through a game plan. You're prepared with principles. And one of the things I really love about our experts, they are experts. You are a licensed marriage and family therapist, licensed professional counselor, and a certified sex therapist, right? So with the licensing, you've, you've, you've had training. It's not just, you know, Naquan's guess or, or perspective. This is research-based. You've had training. 
And, yes. and, I, and I highlight that because there are a lot of people of great intent. There are a lot of people that just want to talk about their own experiences. But one yes. of the things we tend to really dive deep into are those that have formal training in that area. Talk about why training matters and why you shouldn't just listen to every and anybody when it comes to topics like sex and relationships. Absolutely. So you definitely, you know, take things with a grain of salt, right? You got your TikTok therapists and things like that, that are not, you know, professionally trained. And the issue is they, like you said, well-intentioned, but leaves space for harm. And it's something to be mindful of. So it is important to pay attention to where you're getting your information from. Is it rooted in, in theory and technique? Or is it just someone's, you know, opinion? You know what they say about opinions? Everybody has one. But these, like you said, they're curated by a trained sex therapist who is basing it off of principles, who understands the necessary components of relationship, of boundaries, of sexual intimacy, and sexual health, and can assist you in having those difficult conversations mm -hmm. while creating a safe space. Right. So these products build, they help you to build and design a healthy relationship and great sex life that is perfect for you, but is also rooted in a breaking generational dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And you also have the hours of experience. I think those that are listening, they may ask the question like, well, why not just go to the coach? Or why not just go to the person that has a website that talks about sex? Well, they don't have the hours that have been documented. One of the cool parts about being a licensed professional, you can, when I say you, anybody can pull up the criteria, right? Yeah. Like Naquan as a licensed marriage family therapist has over 1500 hours doing systemic based work. That's minimal. Right. You've been in the game for years. So when you add up the, the total hours of experience, the resume is there. And I bring this out to people because we we find it so much harder as, as licensed clinicians to have someone come into our office or, or meet with us virtually for counseling. And we have to be so mindful of all of the bad information. We got to help them purge out. Right. And how many couples. Yes. Or, or, I'm sure you can relate. How many couples you've seen that will tell you, man, if I would have met you a year ago, six months ago, we would have been in a better space. So those okay. that are listening, I, I advocate for trained professionals because it saves you time. It saves you grief on the back end. And don't get me wrong. You have a lot of phenomenal trained coaches as well. So if you're a coach or a counselor that's trained, that's important. So those that are listening, go to someone that's trained, ask them, ask the coach, ask the counselor, how many couples have you actually worked with, right? Um, because yes. I see you have a licensed professional counseling credential as well. LPCs aren't required to see any couples to get no, that license. No, not at all. And, and just to clarify, so in LMFTs in Texas are required to have 3,000 hours. Wow. We have 3,000 3, hours. hours. Okay. Yes. We're not even getting into the sex therapy certification, right? So like heavy on, on the training because we want to provide great quality care for, you know, people in general, but especially for marginalized communities. Now, now just for clarity, because I'm out of North Carolina, when I said the 15, I was speaking just systemic in general. Are you saying oh, okay. Texas have to do 3,000 only like systemic or 3,000 total? So 3,000 total, 1,500 direct. 750, I want to say, um, families and couples. Okay, got you. Yeah. So so that, that piece is huge to, to highlight. And with social media being where most people are turning for their, you know, information. Yeah. Uh, that, that's another reason why we, we, we really are big on hosting professionals on this platform. And, um, you know, a lot of the guests that you hear will have that licensed marriage and family therapist credential behind their name. And that that is intentional because a marriage isn't something you, you want to play with. And when you think about marriage underdogs, we understand that the brand of the show is not just, you know, flowers and roses, right? We're targeting couples that are in a tough season. And, and I personally want to make sure you get the best. If you're in a tough season of marriage, you need to have experts in front of you. You need to have the best professionals in the country, in on the planet available. And I feel like 
licensed marriage and family therapists fit that fit that criteria. I agree wholeheartedly. Definitely. Wholeheartedly I, being in this place of oh, uh, just marriage is not marriage with a good teammate, as you and I were discussing, mm -hmm. um, is is everything. It's it's the best thing, but all relationships have conflict. Right. And if you aren't, if you don't know how to resolve that in an effective way, and if you and your partner have gotten in a rough spot, definitely reach out to somebody because you don't have to walk through it alone. And there are a lot of us that are willing to walk with you and to assist you with learning these principles. Absolutely. And um, one of the things that, that I want to highlight as we transition, you are a speaker as well. And I yes. bring that to the audience's attention because I want you to take time to share about a recent engagement you had with a retreat of, of, of women. And you shared some information with these women on how to unleash their pleasure, if I'm getting that right. Can you share about that talk? Absolutely. So this retreat was geared towards Black women who, as historically speaking, Black women have been um, taught to prioritize the pleasure of others, right? And so I spent some time with about 35 to 55 um, aged women teaching them how to prioritize their own pleasure by getting to know their own bodies first. I'm a big advocate on, you know, identifying your own erogenous zones. Before you can really teach someone how to pleasure you, you do need to understand what your body enjoys. And so I talked to them about first creating a healthy relationship with themselves, first and foremost, and then they can create that healthy relationship with others, which allows them to prioritize their pleasure, allows them to prioritize prioritize and experience the pleasure of others. So it was an amazing talk. There was a lot of, um, there's always a lot of shame around sex for a lot of women, especially Black women who have been taught, you know, not to talk about sex, right? A lot of, I did a survey actually with these women and so many of them had learned about sex from, you know, friends. Mm. They didn't get the information from um, their parents, and so with that, you get a lot of wrong information or either you're not talking about it at all. And so there was just a lot of freedom in that space where women were given permission to experience pleasure, to prioritize their own pleasure and not just the pleasure of others. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you broke that down because those that are listening, if you are part of any organizations that can host Naquan to come in for a talk, I would be highly recommended, especially when you think about the lack of representation. I recall at the top of the show, Naquan, you mentioned that, um, you know, you make up what four minorities make up four percent of the population yes. of, of 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 therapists, that, and then it even gets smaller when you think about those that are trained to talk about sex from an educational and therapeutic lens, and um, you know, it's just just amazing that that, that you 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 know, are in this space because there's so many women and men for that matter that, that benefit from your skill set and expertise. Um, I, yes. I, I know you wanted to um, mention, and I don't want to spill the uh, surprise. You had a surprise for the listeners. I wanted you to you mention that, talk about that. I absolutely do. So for a week, I am giving Marriage Underdogs listeners 25% off of these products, again, the Digital Guide to Intimacy and the uh, Relationship and Sex deck that you can throw in your purse. You can throw this deck in your purse, take it on a picnic, right? Don't make it, well, you definitely, it's, it's important business, but you can also utilize this on date nights with couples, with friends, with yourself. These are awesome journal prompts. And so I'm giving Marriage Underdogs 25% off using the discount code UNDERDOGS plural with an S for a week from today. And then whatever from today, there's a week that you have access to this code. So definitely take advantage and utilize these resources that will absolutely transform your relationship with yourself. It builds self-love because before, here's one of my absolute favorite cards. 
This is the, from the healthy relationship section. Define love and how it looks and feels. If you cannot define this for yourself, how can you share this with anyone else? That also indicates that you are not loving yourself intentionally, right? And so before we can teach others how to love us intentionally, we surely should be um, doing it ourselves. And so these are amazing for individuals. They're amazing for couples. They're amazing for people that are newly separated. Of course, that's not the goal, right? But if you are in that space and you need to get back to you, these are awesome. For couples, if you, this one, do you feel safe and secure with me? What can I do to help increase those feelings, right? There are a lot of meaningful questions here that will assist you with building the relationship that is perfect for you. So definitely take advantage of the discount code underdogs for this next week and watch your relationships with yourself and your partner transform. And for those that are listening, may, may be coaches or therapists in the helping space. These yes. are cards that you can purchase to help enhance the work with your clients. If you're seeking to uh, refer homework for your clients to, to do, I would, I would advise that you, you, you point your clients toward purchasing these products as well. And I like the fact, Naquan, that these products are for, those couples that are working to heal and repair and mend a relationship, but they're also there to help a couple recharge, restore, and revitalize their relationship too. So it really covers the whole gambit when you think about a relationship. It doesn't just target the couples that are doing well. It doesn't just target those that might need help. It targets every couple. And every that's couple. The of the products. If you are in the beginning stages, because I do premarital mm -hmm. therapy as well, Right. I utilize these as homework assignments to assist my clients with, OK, you don't because you don't if you're a new couple, you don't necessarily have a foundation to stand on. Right. So I'm assisting you with building that. And that way you can be proactive and you don't have to be reparative. Like you're repairing something. You're trying to restore it. There's nothing if you're there then we've, I know I've been there in my marriage. I I am, be clear, I am a marriage underdog myself. And so I know what it's like to re restore and repair, you know, my foundation. I've been there. I've done the work from a clinical standpoint and I've done it in my own marriage. And so for the couple who is starting out, for the couple who, you know, is in the thick of it and needs to take it back to the basics, and for the individuals who are just trying to love themselves intentionally, these products are for you. Nice. I, I love it. This is great because those that are listening have an opportunity to get 25% off for the entire week. And I believe the work you're doing is going to just continue to bless marriages around the world. Uh, Naquan, thank you so much for coming on the show. We got to have you back again as well. Uh, we're just covering the surface of all the value that you uh, can provide to the listeners based on your skill set. And uh, for those that have been tuning in, you've been listening to Marriage Underdogs Radio Show. I am your host, Chris A. Matthews. Please uh, locate us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify for our weekly episodes and drop comments. Also, feel free to uh, like the uh, episodes as well as we as we work to continue to grow our viewership and share share this episode if you know someone that can benefit outside of yourself remember sharing is caring so make sure you share the episode as well and uh, we'll tune back in next week i uh, once again thank you naquan for being a guest and i just wish everyone listening a, a prosperous uh, relationship and remember that it requires that you open up in order to heal up. That's right.